Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Beautiful name, powerful name, you better believe it. It's a great name and uh, it's good to be with you guys this morning. Happy New Year. Haven't seen most of you since last year, so hopefully you've been, been good. And uh, excited to dive into Genesis chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, turn there, please. Fire and Fury. Not just my nickname from my roller derby team from 20 years ago, but the name of a new memoir that paints a picture of a dysfunctional White House. As if we needed a memoir to tell us about the dysfunction in the White House. Now, I pray for our government. And uh, I pray for our president and I pray for our leaders. But I, I, I'm not necessarily consumed by the dysfunction in, in the White House. What about the dysfunction in our own houses? Amen. Amen? Some of you are like looking like, we live in the same house together. How dare you say that? How about dysfunction in the world? All of us can look around the world and realize that things are not the way they ought to be. Right? And perhaps the greatest memoir written on the dysfunction that is taking place around the world is on our very hands right now, and it's called the Bible. See, what we have to realize is that the Bible is a pretty honest expose of the world that we live in, that it's not the way things ought to be. And... As I've been considering, you know, at, at the end of every year, as we approach the end of a calendar year, I go, God, what do you want for the people of Missio Dei? What do you want me as a pastor of this flock to, 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 to instruct the people in so that they could become greater worshipers of you and greater followers of Jesus Christ? And boy, as I just think about our world, I think about the fact that we don't understand the origin story. That if we understand what this is all about, we can not only make sense of the world and all the dysfunction that is there, we begin to understand us. And I'll tell you what, if we do not learn from our past, if we don't learn from history, someone once wisely said we are doomed to repeat it. If we don't understand the origin, the, the design, the meaning, the purpose, the significance of it all, we will end up buying into philosophies that will not bring God glory and will bring us incredible dissatisfaction. And so we get to embark on a journey together into the book of Genesis, which if you haven't found it yet, it's the first book of the Bible. And we get to look at some prime evil history. How does that sound? The first 11 chapters of Genesis, if you do not understand the first 11 chapters of Genesis, you won't understand the entire Bible. This is how important this is. That we get to go back to the beginning and we get to understand God's great story and your part in it. I remember a few years ago when the movie Noah was released, Russell Crowe, I don't know if you saw it, I loved it much to the chagrin of other followers of Jesus who chose, chose to boycott it. Someone said, the reason your Christians are upset over this movie Noah and some of its creative license it takes in explaining the narrative of Noah and the flood is because of this. And, and I remember one wise person said this when the movie was released. Perhaps the main lesson Christians are to learn from this movie is that if we do not tell the story, others will. We don't understand the story. And if you don't understand the story, you don't understand the main characters. You don't understand the main themes. You don't understand the main objective. If you do not understand the story, other people will. And we live in a world where people are telling a story that's not true. And people are buying into these false worldviews and these illusions and all this stuff that doesn't sync up with God's original design. 
So this morning we get to embark on a journey together of several months. And I will tell you, we may be lucky to get done with this by the end of this year. This is how good this is because not only do we get to understand things about the cosmos and the universe and creation and evolution, but we get to understand things when it comes to our relationship with God. Why did God design us anyways? What is our purpose as human beings? What about relationships with one another? What is my role as a man? What is your role as a woman? What is our role in marriage? What's the function of marriage? Why do we have kids? What's the responsibility we have towards our kids? What responsibility do we have towards one another? What about government? What about disobeying God? What about living with with a rebellious heart towards him who created us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think any of those topics are pertinent for today? You better believe it. And if you think we're going to unpack Genesis 1 through 11 in just a matter of three, four months, you're mistaken. Because if we don't understand the story, you're going to buy into another narrative and you will end up missing God and being dissatisfied in life. And that's not what I want for anybody. So this morning will serve as foundational to the things we're going to unpack in greater detail in the weeks and months to come. So you'll notice in your outline six points substantiated with a myriad of verses. Now here's the good news. We're not going through all the verses. But what I want you to do this week is to take one point a day and use those verses as personal meditation. Okay? We'll touch on them. I'll, I'll highlight the points. But maybe this week, Monday you take point one, Tuesday you take point two, and make this just a time of devotion between you and God so that these truths will sink in past your mind, into your heart, into your soul, and may they minister to who you are in the totality of who God created you to be. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. Full stop. Matter of fact, let's not even deal with the, the whole verse. Let's just deal with the first four words. In the beginning, God. Full stop. See, what I love about the scripture is that the story starts with a person. The existence of God. Point number one. The story begins with a person, not a thing, and no attempt by the writer of Genesis is made to water it down, to apologize to a skeptical age, even to prove that God is. It's right there. In the beginning, God. It is no accident that God is the subject of the first sentence of the Bible. Why? Because God has always existed God is self-sufficient, he is self-existent, he always has been, he always will be, he is the ultimate cause, and he himself is the uncaused cause, he has no origins, unlike the title of our series, so we have to begin into a place where we're humbled by the magnificence and the majesty of God. In the beginning, God. See, what we have to understand about this, this transcendent being we label God at first is that he himself is unknowable. And yet, part of the story is he makes himself known. Second, he is answerable to no one. Because he is the one that has always been, and before him nothing has been, and he would be totally fine as if nothing existed other than himself. A.W. Tozer said this, God has a voluntary relation to everything he has made, but he has no necessary relation to anything outside of himself. He is totally fine to just be who he is. He didn't need to create anything. He's not a lonely being. He's not the kind of being that says, boy, I wish I had company over right now. He is totally fine and self-sufficient in and of himself. He himself was never made. He has no beginning. There is nothing before him. He is individual. He is infinite. He is perfect. Here is the first self-evident truth. Write these two words down with an exclamation point. God is. Boom. And what I love about the simplicity of this opening to Genesis is that it refutes false worldviews today. Atheism. 
See, what this verse says is it assumes that, but does not try to prove the existence of God. It says to the atheist, God is. To the agnostic, we are given the knowledge that God exists, information the agnostic professes to be without. And you guys really know what an agnostic is. They're just a cowardly atheist. They're not willing to go the full length. Yeah, God may be there. He may not be there. What about someone who's polytheistic, meaning they believe in many gods? Well, this verse points us to only one God who is seen at work in this verse. Pantheism, the idea that the speaker's God, the tree is God, the sun is God. Well, pantheism is destroyed by this verse because God is seen as separate from his creation, receding it and superior to it. Materialism. That God is seen as superior to matter and that the material universe is revealed to have a distinct beginning. A problem scientists have dealt with for centuries that matter has not always been. We don't live in a naturalistic world. What about the thing that this is, something came out of nothing? See, scientists have not been able to explain. Most of them agree that there was some sort of big bang back in the, the, the day but what, how does something come from nothing? How about humanism? Because this is about God, not man, and that God is the ultimate reality. So lest you start thinking too highly of yourself, stop. And lastly, what about the belief in evolutionism? Because God created all things. So you see how this, these first four words, in the beginning, God refutes those worldviews. This sublime statement debunks all those belief systems. So what are we left with? Well, Psalm chapter 14, verse 1 says, The fool says in his heart there is no God. It is foolish to say that God does not exist. The Bible says you would be a fool to consider the universe, the cosmos, your world, this planet, and come to the conclusion that there is no God. Well, there's a reason why the atheist ex basically explains God out of this scenario. It's this idea that they don't want to be accountable to something beyond themselves. Atheists are pretty... They think they're morally superior to other people. And it's interesting that we say morally superior or intellectually superior, right? As if there's something innate within us that ought to strive for something greater than us. But in the end, they don't want to be accountable to something more powerful than them. Perhaps something that they can't explain and they don't like that. Huxley, Julian Huxley, famous philosopher, atheist, basically came out and said, you know why I don't want to believe that there's a God? Because I want to live out my sexuality any way I please. See, if there is a God, he basically says, there's a proper way to conduct your life sexually. Huxley said, I don't want that. Matter of fact, there's a great book written by a guy, he's a psychologist named Paul Vitz, called Faith of the Fatherless, and he basically says, 13 of the 18 most prominent atheists ever grew up without fathers in their lives. And because they were fatherless, this is why they conclude that there's no God out there. C.S. Lewis pointed out this. Christianity is not a patent medicine. Christianity claims to give account of facts to tell you what the real universe is like. Its account of the universe may be true or it may not. And once the question is really before you, then your natural inquisitiveness must make you want to know the answer. If Christianity is untrue, then no honest man will want to believe it, however helpful it might be. But if it is true, every honest man will want to believe it, even if it gives him no help at all. And yet when all is said and done, Spurgeon, I think, nails it. Check this out. I am persuaded that men think that there is no God because they wish there were none. They find it hard to believe in God and go on in sin so that they try to get an easy conscience by denying his existence. Romans 1 says, men and women suppress the truth and unrighteousness. The universe tells us 
of the power of God. The universe tells us of the magnificence of God. There is better explanation for a universe where there's intelligent design involved versus a universe where things just happen by random chance. You guys realize how amazing this world is we live in? We're going to talk about this in the weeks to come. But this world is perfectly suited for life, for you and I to be here. If it was any different, we would not be here at all. If the, the, the earth which is on a 22-degree axis. If it was one degree closer to the sun, we would all melt and burn. If it was one degree further away, we would all freeze to death. Fine-tuned. Just like walking along the beach and you happen upon the most magnificent Rolex watch you've ever seen, you don't sit there and go, boy, I'm glad the sand and the tides and the oceans created this masterpiece. You sit there and go, this watch implies there's a watchmaker. But yet, once that watchmaker reveals himself, the question is, do you want to submit yourself to such a power that is beyond you? This is why the creed begins this way. I believe in God, the creator of heaven and earth. You have to start with that. See, God is totally fine in and of himself, but yet he created something out of nothing. He created everything out of nothing. Nothing existed before him, yet he speaks it into existence. Pretty remarkable. Point number one, right? The existence of God. It is absurd to say that something came from nothing. That is a philosophical impossibility. But it is not absurd to say that someone brought the universe into existence from non-existence. More on that next week. Second point is this. So the story, front and center, God. But you have to understand that there's the fact that there's the story is all about God. This is the glory of God. Why did God choose to create everything? Because he is a God who exists to receive maximum glory from his creation. He thought it well worthwhile to create the cosmos, to create the world. The fact that you can look through telescopes at nebulae and supernovas and dwarf stars, and I sound pretty intellectual only because I went to the little observatory a couple weeks ago, so I've, I've brushed up on my astronomy. But you look through a telescope at things that you can't see with the, the, the naked eye, and you're blown away by this. I remember uh, last year taking my kids to Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, and we snuck in because one of the workers up there gave us a preview of the Clark Telescope, which is a huge telescope, and it was under construction, but he said, come here. So we thought we were on some inside scoop information, right? He has us look through, and we can see perfectly Saturn and the rings around it. And my kids and I and Lori were just awestruck, right? Because we just realized this is something magnificent, this is something incredible. And yet, God does not want us to worship Saturn or anything we see through a telescope or even in the macro, micro universe of things we see through microscopes. See, God created all of this so that he could receive the glory. See, what we have to understand is that God is the central character in the story and it makes perfect sense that everything is about him and designed to bring him maximum glory. And you may be asking yourself, what is God's glory? That God has infinite perfections, infinite greatness, infinite worth. That God's glory is the radiance of his holiness, the radiance of his manifold, infinitely worthy and valuable perfections. And this is important for us to understand because you and I are glory stealers. Amen? Amen? I mean, and it's getting worse in our culture where we think things are about us and it really is not about you. See, in understanding God, we need to understand that the world revolves around him. I can't tell you how many times I've said, even in the past two weeks to my, one of my children, this world does not revolve around you. Any, any parents in the same boat with, with us? Okay. You know, there's those moments you, you, you think back upon your own childhood and you're like, I'll never say that to my kids. I can't believe my mom or my dad's saying that to me. And then you sit there and go, I'm really living my mom and dad's life again. 
when you have to address your child, look them straight in the face and remind them that the world does not revolve around them. And God says to us the same thing. The world does not revolve around you. Psalm 19 says, the, the heavens declare the glory of God. John 17, Jesus says, there is a glory that existed among the Trinity before anything ever came into being. Romans 11 says, all things have been created for God's glory. 1 Corinthians 10 says, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, bring glory to God. The glory of God is the objective of everything that has ever been created. The trees magnify and glorify God. The mountains magnify and glorify God. But you and I are different, and we're going to talk about humanity in, in a few weeks, but you and I have the capacity to do it willingly and voluntarily. God understands that sin compels us to become glory stealers, and so it's important to understand your part in the story that you're not the most important part. You're a part, but you're not the most important part. And yet, when problems come into our lives, let me just tell you right now, it's usually because we think the story's about us. And people think the story's about them and their happiness and their comfort and their personal prosperity, and they wonder what went wrong when things go in a different direction because God intervenes because he doesn't like his glory stolen. There was a track years ago used in sharing Jesus with people. Remember the days of tracks? People would send, give you a little pamphlet that told you the good news, right? Well, perhaps one of the most popular ones basically said, God has an amazing plan for your life. And something about that always rubbed me the wrong way. Because I'm thinking the... the, the the heart of the message, yeah, I can believe in it, but should we approach the good news in saying God has a wonderful plan for your life? See, the story is not so much about God's plan for your life as it is about your life for God's plan. So let's, let's understand the sequence of, of why we're here. This is not about us being the center of the world, the universe, the, the fact that things revolve around us, and that God's a part of it. But let's understand that God is the heart of it all, and he's created you for a purpose. So what is your life for God's plan? That's the real question. Because I think if we believe the other way, we will all come to a point where we end up miserable and dissatisfied because we thought it was all about us. Second point. Third point. The ownership of God. So everything belongs to Him. So here's this existent being who's always existed, who now creates, and the focus of His creation is His glory, and He wants you to know that He owns it all. I mean, let's be honest, the principle is if you make it, it's yours. I mean, how many times people fight over things? I mean, I was watch I like Shark Tank, right? So I'm watching Shark Tank, and let me just tell you, I'm going to share a couple of illustrations because we just went on vacation, which means we were in a hotel room which had a TV, which had cable, which we don't have at, at the house. And all of a sudden now when cable's introduced into Scott Morgan's life, boy, there's lots of illustrations from, from cable TV. So I'm watching Shark Tank. And there's a woman there declaring that she was the first to patent this idea and that there's tons of people that are trying to infringe upon what she had created. And she was ticked off, right? That I'm, I'm the one who created this and now there's all these people out there trying to steal the idea. Well, here's the fact that God created it all. He owns it all. And yet we are taking something that really doesn't belong to us when we think that it is all about us, we own our bodies, we own our stuff, and when you have an ownership mentality, there's no room for God in the picture. And I, and I want you to know this morning that when you realize that God owns everything, it makes a difference in how you live your life. See, God owns us, we don't own ourselves, which 
affects two things. Number one, when you hear people say, I can do whatever I want with my body. That is a lie that doesn't reflect any honor for God. I mean, we usually hear this in controversial settings, usually having to do with the topic of abortion or something like that. I have a right over my body and you can't tell me what I can do with my body. Excuse me? Because the second truth is this. God made us, and if God made us, then our bodies are not our own. So you can't do whatever you want to your body. And, and let me just say, we're going to talk about this in the, in the weeks to come. And I'm going to tell you right now that even on the topic of abortion, I, I, we are, the Bible is pro-life. And if you're here and you've gone through that procedure, it is not the unforgivable sin. But from this moment on, we need to understand that we do not belong to ourselves. We do not own ourselves. We are accountable to something, someone higher than us. And when you realize that you don't own your body, it makes a difference in how you conduct your life. And yet I see people spending their life in such reckless ways. And they wonder why they're so miserable. C.S. Lewis once again said this. Does it not make a difference whether I am, so to speak, the landlord of my own mind and body? Or only a tenant responsible to the real landlord? If somebody else made me for his own purposes, then I shall have a lot of duties which I should not have if I simply belong to myself. Lest you think you're just an owned object, you're mistaken. Because here's what I want you to know, that even though you don't own your body, that you cannot do whatever you want with your body, you need to know that you are human beings precious to God in the same way that any child is precious to a parent. That not only is he sovereign king who's created everything, but you're, he's also father. And we need to understand this, that God has designed us for good things. And the moment we think we have better decisions to, to make regarding our lives and our bodies is the moment we miss out on what God's greater, more, His better intentions are for us. Did you know that Christianity really is the only faith that speaks in terms like this? I mean, if you're just part of some illusion like some Eastern religions teach... There's really not that significance on your life. You just live life however you want. There's this, there's this dualistic nature, right? Like what you do with your body is one thing, but what you do with your spirit is another, and we live these bifurcated lives. Even in Islam, you never speak of Allah with terms like dad or father. That is blasphemous within Muslim religion. And we have to understand that the, the God that we worship and adore invites us to think of him in terms like this. That he is our father and that we can approach him like children and go, Dad, what do you want me to do with my, with my body? What do you want me to do with my time? What do you want me to do with my... See, when you realize that all that God has created really belongs to him, it makes a difference how you conduct your life. Number four, the separateness of God. When we talk about these things, we need to understand that God is distinct from the rest of his creation. See, according to theism, which is the belief that there is a God behind it all, all existence is divided into two categories. You ready for this? God and everything else. Isn't that awesome? Don't you love the simplicity of what God's shown us? Two categories. There's God, there's everything else. There's the creator, there's the creation. And the Bible wants us to understand that because we have been created with this capacity to worship, sometimes we worship things other than the creator. Can I tell you right now, nature is not to be worshipped. The earth is not to be worshipped. 
I've hugged a few trees in my life, but that doesn't make me a worshiper of, of, of the trees. The planets, the moon, the stars, the sun, these are things not to be worshipped, but these are things that point to the, the creator of these things. All these things are meant to point us to worship Him who is really beyond and behind these things. And so, God is eternal and He chose to bring into existence everything else, even the space-time continuum that He is not a part of. In the beginning, time, which God is not involved in, in in the sense of being within, but he's outside of that. He even created time. Now, talk about lying in your bed at night, not trying, not being able to fall asleep because you're thinking about eternity. I remember doing this as a young kid, going, how far back does history go? Before, before there ever was anything... What, God, how do you, I mean, and then you think about eternity future and your mind just goes, right? See, we believe that God's existence is the best explanation for our existence. That we have been created to worship and that God has made enough of Himself known that we should now be preoccupied with, with glorifying Him and worshiping Him. And if you really miss that, you're going to miss everything. That God is not like us. Even Paul in Acts 17 said, God does not dwell in, in temples made with human hands. Yet in Him we live and we move and we have our being. Isaiah talks about the potter and the clay. Like God is distinct in his creative ability in that we are the clay and he is the potter and he designs and he sculpts. And what right does the clay have to say to the potter? Why do you make me like this? And so the Bible is clear that you exist to understand that there's a distinction between you and the creator of all things. So as I reflect back on 2017, every year I compile my top 25 movies of the year list. 25 movies out of hundreds of movies I see, and I love movies. So top 25 movies, and I know you're all eager to know what my number one movie of 2017 is, and it's not Mean Girls 4, so just to, I'll put that, put that rumor to, to rest. The best movie last year... And if I was a betting man, I believe probably no one here has ever seen it. It is called A Ghost Story. You saw it? A few of you? You guys are sick individuals. No, you're... Here's the thing. Perhaps one of the most spiritual movies I've seen in years. It's a story of death. Some of you are like, all right, off my list. I'm not going to see that. I don't want to be depressed. Right? But yet it's about the fact that there is something beyond this world. And Casey Affleck and um, Rooney Mara, I think is her name. But best movie of the year. You can get Redbox. So some of you are going to go this week and rent it. Give it a chance. An hour and a half of your time. It's going to make it feel like four hours. But I'm just going to tell you, stick with it. And I'm going to tell you right now, it raises topics and it raises subjects that we don't usually discuss. Now, I'm going to tell you about a scene in the movie that is not going to ruin the movie. So in this movie, a ghost story, a woman loses her husband in an accident. And really, it's about coping with loss and grieving the loss of someone you love. Well, there's a scene in the movie where there's a party at a house and a guy is sitting at a table discussing the meaning and significance of life. And he basically says, there are one of two options you have. The first, he says, he points at a girl, he's like, hey, do you have God? And when she says she doesn't, he says that finding real meaning in life becomes much trickier without God. Are you kidding me? All right. I'm liking this. I'm liking this, this story. I'm liking this. Life becomes trickier without God. 
He goes on to say that all the great symphonies were written for God. And if that divine component went missing, a composer's justification for those works shrinks. Then he's a, he says there's a second explanation for meaning and significance. He says, by being remembered after you're dead. Because if you choose to live life without God, then it's about you and you hope you leave something that people are going to remember you by. And then he says, we all do it. But then he begins to take this nihilistic trip through the cosmos and basically says, but what we have to realize is that once everything comes to nothing and it all disappears and explodes and burns, then we're left with nothing. And it's this really depressing message. And he says, of course, then it's not depressing if you have God. So that scene, which is really kind of a centerpiece of the movie, reveals to us something that Hollywood, they've got an itch. And this movie's scratching that itch. If you watch the media, if you pay attention to the news, if you're, if you're following the world events and the course of things that are going on, not just in our country but beyond us, you realize that God is involved in our world yet distinct from it. And if you try to live life apart from God, it gets tricky. So it makes sense to find meaning and significance in Him. Him who is not like you, but Him who is a personal God who wants to have relationship with you, which brings us to number five. The kingdom of God. The sovereign king has proper authority to rule over all that he has made. Here it is, the great theme of the story that is contained within the scriptures from Genesis to revelation it is about the kingdom of god if there's a kingdom there must be a king and if that king has created everything then he has the right to sovereignly rule over it but the word i need to insert here is that this sovereign king's rule is a benevolent rule meaning god is a God of love. He is a God of compassion. He is a God of kindness. This is why we go through the creation days that we're going to look at over the next few weeks. And he says that all of creation is good, but when he comes to creating man and woman in his image, he says that that creation is very good. Because man, woman, distinct among all of creation. And even the psalmist in Psalm 8 says, What is man that you should think so highly of him? See, what we have to understand is that here is the answer to the questions we all ask. What is the meaning of everything? What's it all about anyways? What is the point of life? Has anyone ever asked themselves those questions? We all have. And isn't it interesting that all humanity asks themselves a question as if there's something planted within each of our makeup that says you should be looking for something meaningful and significant beyond yourself. So the story of creation, the rule of this benevolent ruler over it, this is the theme of the Scriptures. And I will tell you this morning that the beautiful part of this theme and this message is that God actively participates in his creation. He doesn't love us from a distance, but he loves us up close. And we don't even get three chapters into the story when man botches it all. And yet what does God do? He pursues and he shows grace. And then man botches it again. And what does God do? He pursues and he shows grace. And man does it again and again and again and again. We can go on and on and on. And every time God pursues and extends grace. Genesis is a book about grace. See, in the beginning, God didn't have to, but he did. Created created magnificent things, and yet the apex of God's creation, you and me, He created knowing full well that we would botch it up. 
And yet he is glorified and magnified in it because he is still sovereign king over his kingdom. But the problem is, is when the subjects in the kingdom don't live with God's glory in focus. When we think the story is about us, when we think the glory belongs to us, you want to know why we are where we're at? Is because we are missing out on understand what does God's benevolent rule look like in my life, your life, our lives. See, because He is there, we are not alone. Because He speaks, we are not in the dark. Because He participates, we are not forsaken. Because He makes Himself known, we can know Him. And hence now, there's direction, there's objective, there's understanding. And this is the beauty of God's kingdom. That now we can fulfill our chief purpose, which is this. Write it down. To glorify this King. And when you live out of that purpose, then you will know the deepest satisfaction, which is enjoying this King. And all I'm doing is cleverly summing up to you something that was written a few hundred years ago called the Westminster Shorter Catechism, which said, what is the purpose of man? And it answered, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Purpose, glorify God. Satisfaction, to enjoy Him. You know what my prayer is for us? Is to, to, to experience what the psalmist experienced. In Psalm 42 when he said, Boy, my soul thirsts. And it doesn't know satisfaction until it drinks deeply from you, God. To know what the psalmist experiences when he writes words like Psalm 23, that the Lord is is my shepherd and in him there shall be no want see we try to satisfy ourselves with things that were never in meant to be to, to be satisfied in god has created us for himself and until we find that satisfaction in him we will be restless what is your purpose to glorify God? And, and what is the deepest satisfaction you can have is to enjoy Him. And what does it mean to enjoy Him? It means to just love the King, to understand your life in His kingdom, and to do that not just here, but for all eternity. This is training ground for eternity, you guys. You, you, you need to understand that. You guys realize you're just passing through this world. The Bible says you're sojourners, you're travelers, you're aliens. You were created for another kingdom. Your citizenship is not right now uh, primarily of the United States or whatever country you may hail from. Your citizenship, according to Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, is in heaven. And this is the beautiful part about God's kingdom. It's breaking into the world now and it is a kingdom that will never be disrupted and will live forever because all the kingdoms that lift themselves up in pride and in power will come to nothing because the one kingdom that will last forever is the God, the kingdom of God. Herein lies the drama of the majority of the Bible. Really, Genesis 1 and 2, things are good. Genesis 3, it all goes haywire. And then here's the story about how the kingdom of God is continually breaking in. And yet we find, and we'll get to this, that ultimately the kingdom is found, is discovered, is experienced, is enjoyed through the person and work of Jesus Christ. He basically himself said in John 17, that I am the kingdom of God. Pretty awesome. But yet, if we don't understand the benevolent rule of the sovereign king, the kids are in control of the kingdom, and when kids are, kids are in control of the kingdom, it is nothing but chaos. Cable show we were watching in our hotel room one night. I told you there's a couple of these, all right? 
And I was working, trying to work on message prep stuff while we were away, and yet Lori and the kids were watching some show, and I forgot, it's either on TLC or HDTV. Those, those are horrible channels. You guys realize this. All they do is no, so nothing but discontent in your life, and, um, or show you how good your life really is if you're watching TLC. And there was a show on about these brothers that just control and manipulate their dad. They are going through problems themselves, but they don't take ownership for their problems. They blame it on their parents, and the parents do nothing but enable their kids. Have you ever met kids that are in control of their families? Have you ever seen children in control of your parents? Have you ever been to a restaurant and thought to yourself, oh my, that child runs the roost, right? You ever seen this? This is not good. It's terrible. Some of you probably have kids like that. Change it. Kids were never designed to run the house. They are master manipulators, I will tell you this. They are little minions from Satan that try to control things that they can't, are not designed to control. I'm not talking about my minions, I'm talking about your minions, right? Trust me, I have my minions, I'm like, wah, right? But you need to understand that the kids were never meant or designed to be in control. You are not meant to be the king of the kingdom. There's only one king. He's a sovereign king. He's a benevolent king. But unless you understand you're subject to him, things will not work out the way you want them to. Amen? God's kingdom is what the world's craving. They just can't seem to get out of the way and submit themselves to a better authority, higher authority, a greater authority. Last point. Here's the good news. The love of God. The story culminates in the greatest demonstration of grace ever. You need to understand that no one can script the biblical drama that we are a part of. I mean, who comes up with stuff like this? God does. And it's meant to glorify Him and show how incredibly awesome He is. Here's what the Bible says, is that God has always existed in a Trinitarian way. Three persons, one God, all perfectly self-satisfied within one Godhead, didn't need us, wasn't lonely, wasn't lacking anything, and yet created. And yet, what creation seems to do in rebelling itself against God, God brings it back together. And this is the story, right? The love of God, the greatest demonstration of grace ever. That before the foundation of the world, Norm touched upon this in communion, God made a plan to save you. Ephesians chapter 1, before anything ever existed in the mind of the Godhead, they had a plan to redeem you. See, this is something that blows my mind, before anything ever came into being. See, we know the work of art produced by a painter because they take what's in their mind and they put it on a wall. There's Mona Lisa! There's the existence of memory by Dolly. Whatever painter you like, see, without the tangible, all there is is an idea in the mind. And all of a sudden now, we are given a glimpse into the mind of God who says, I knew what would happen, but you need to know that I'm going to show you my love so that I would be glorified and that you would understand how powerful and amazing and awesome I am. Before anything ever was, you were in his mind and he already planned to save you. Are you kidding me? This is good news that we're a part of the story. And this is what we get to spend the rest of maybe 2018 looking at. Your part in the story and understand that you're playing your part the way God wants you to play your part. That his glory is... is our number one goal and objective. That you don't finish this year, that you don't live your life like the Cleveland Browns did this year with a 0-16 record. 
They just had a parade in Cleveland to celebrate their perfect season. But it was perfect for all the wrong reasons. Literally. And they went around the town counterclockwise to represent the zero in their win record. They had a band on a float and they had a guy out there dancing. Zero sixteen. Only one other, other team has done that in the history of the NFL. There was even a guy who in his will wrote that at his funeral, he wants players from the Cleveland Browns to be his pallbearers because he wants the team to let him down one last time. <laughs> you can't make this up! And yet the love of God says what the world may call you as being a zero, being purposeless, being meaningless, being insignificant. The story of God says you are loved. And when you realize you've been loved and created for a purpose that you will continue to grow and understand, there is no satisfaction like it in all the world. Amen? We are going to have fun. We're going to talk about a lot of great topics. We're going to get into some controversies. But we have a responsibility of understanding our origins. And I thank God that he has given us the story of the origins so that we can make sense of our lives today. Amen? Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, we are thrilled to to be here this morning and to be given another day to not just exist, but to exist for you. You have created January 7th, 2018 for us to know you, for us to love you, for us to to experience you, to realize how awesome you are, to glorify you. Father, that's why we have today. And Lord, if it be your will, if you're so kind to give us another day tomorrow, we will understand that January 8th, 2018 is designed for us to enjoy you, to walk with you, to bring you glory in all we do and say. Forgive us for running hijack with the plan of of our lives, for for forgetting you, for thinking that this is not about you, for thinking that you're just reserved for an hour and a half on a Sunday morning. Lord, there is so much more involved in who we are and why you've created us. Lord, may we continue to grow in these truths so that we realize when we get to eternity, yes, it made a difference to bring you glory, to know you and to know nothing else but you. Lord, thanks for for saving us, for giving us this, this time, and we look forward to the weeks to come. Lord, my prayer is that we would not only walk in the wisdom that you are God and you are there and you've always been there, but that knowing you is the beginning of all satisfaction and riches and knowledge and wonder and everything our hearts ever want. So thank you, God, for today, for loving us in Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord continue to lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace and mercy forever and ever. God bless you guys. We'll see you soon. You have to understand who the, the king of the Cleveland Browns Yes.